we probably should begin. I had promised to say something about ECC codes, and I told you that something that I found something uh, in my email yesterday, so I thought you'd be interested in it. Uh, Reed Solomon codes are used in today's hard disk drives. Well, that was written before yesterday. I would say in almost all of today's hard disk drives. Uh, we're on the verge of seeing the introduction of LDPC codes with iterative decoding, and I think the verge is now. And so this was a press release. I'm not sure why. I took the name of the company off, but maybe I should just mention the company is Linka Media, uh, and it's a company, interestingly, that was formed by a man who used to be in trellis coded modulation at Bell Laboratories, Hemet Topper. And um, in any event, this is what it says uh, so and so announces its low density parity check uh, based device is currently shipping in mainstream two and a half inch mobile hard disk drive products. So currently shipping means it's real. And today's hard disk drive data recovery architectures are mostly based on concatenated coding schemes which use Reed-Solomon error correcting codes invented almost 50 years ago, which you people know. Now by using LDBC based solutions, hard disk drive vendors can continue to double the storage capacity of their drives every 18 months. Uh, not sure. <laughs> uh, and current LDBC-based device reduces the number of errors read from a disk from 1 in 100 to 1 in 100 million. Uh, again, this is a press release of a company. But in any event, the main thing I wanted to tell you is that indeed at least one vendor is selling Two and a half inch drives. Yes? So, what does the two and a half inch exactly refer to? Is it the half? Diameter. The diameter. diameter of the uh, platter. Uh, almost all of your laptops are two and a half inch. Your desktops and bigger are three and a half inch drives. Um, and as I said, there were one inch drives, but no more. OK, so this leads to the second lecture. And what I thought I would do in the second lecture is, first of all, uh, talk about the future. Who knows? <laughs> future uh, of hard disk drives and tell you about two research projects we're doing. And the main reason I'm telling you about them is to tell you that I think, at least, there's interesting information theoretic problems to be solved in this area. So it's possible that the aerial density will saturate very soon. And uh, let me tell you why. The bits are getting smaller and smaller. And as the bits get smaller and smaller, it's harder for them to hold their magnetism. And particularly, neighboring bits interfere with them, and they could collapse. So there's two approaches. Uh, OK, I'm going to skip some terminology. The two solutions that are being followed now by the disk drive industry is one is what's called hammer. And well, let me not try to read that. Let me tell you about it. Um, the way you can get a magnet to hold its magnetism better is by raising the coercivity. That's, see, I can say it now. And the problem is that not only does it hold it better, but when you try to override it, when you try to put another bit in there, it holds on the other one. So what you have to do is lower the coercivity when you're writing, and then raise it when you want to leave it there. So how do you do that as you heat it? Because the coercivity goes down when you heat it. So what you do is do something called heat-assisted magnetic recording, and the heating is done with a laser. That complicates things. OK. The other approach is to separate the bits 
by non-magnetic material. It's kind of like putting insulators around, uh, you know, current carrying things. And this is called pattern media. So here's a picture of heat assisted. And here is the laser and it's heating this bit. And then you can write here. And then once it moves away, it cools and it holds it. The problem is multifold. One is getting the laser to do what you want it to do. The other is to get it to cool fast enough. It, if it stays hot and it moves away, it loses its magnetism. And uh, so this is not an easy thing to do. The other one is to take a disk and make it into magnetic islands with not a sea of non-magnetic material in between. And then this can be ordinary coercivity here, but the fact that it's not interfered with by its neighbors allows this to hold its magnetism. Okay, I'm going to tell you about an information theory problem based upon this pattern media. Okay, and so this is ordinary media, this is pattern media, and the big difference is ordinary media, there's magnetic material everywhere. So no matter where you want to write a bit, it's okay. Here, you try to write a bit in this non-magnetic island, uh, sea of non-magnetic stuff, and you're in trouble. So in ordinary media, one can write a bit anywhere, but in pattern media, one must write each bit on a magnetic island. And this is difficult because you don't know where the islands are. The only way you could know where the islands are is to read before you write. And that's a problem because the difference between the flux in writing and the flux in reading is like 80 dB. And so that's not a good thing to do. So you have to figure out how to write on these islands. So let's assume, and it's going to work or not work because of the shingling effect. So this, is, this goes back to my shingles that I told you about before. You don't really write on one island. You write on a strip of islands. And so let's assume somehow you got on the right track. This, these are now islands. And somehow you're on that track, and you go to write, and you want to write a bit. But you actually write a big bit that because of the shingling effect. And so if you want to write a, a zero in time instant one, you write it not only on island one, but you write it on island one, two, three, and four. And now you go to write on island two. And let's suppose you want to write a one on island two. Well, you write it on two, three, four, and five. And lo and behold, you've left a zero on island one, which is your objective. And now you want to write an island, you know, three, four, five, and six with a one. And that's okay. And you've now left zero, one, one. That's, that's good. But now comes the problem. Suppose you're shingling, you write a little bit late, and you miss in time four, you want to write in four, five, six, and seven, but you miss four. So what you do is you write on five, six, seven, and eight. Well, the problem is now you wanted to write a zero in position four, but a one is there because of the shingling from the previous thing you wrote. Okay, and that causes an error. And if, however, do you always cause an error when you miss the bit? No. Because of the shingling effect, if you wanted to write a zero in the next bit, you see, you wanted to write it in position five, one, two, three, four, five. And you missed five, but from the previous one, a zero was there. So sometimes you have an error when you write late, 
and sometimes you don't. Now, let me stop and say, is this the whole story? Absolutely not. You can make this much more complicated. But what, you know, I know you were given a homework assignment by Sergio to read Shannon's, you know, important thing to you and Shannon. I don't know what your answers are, and I'm not sure I could answer as one important thing, but one of the things that I learned in reading Shannon and also probably more from Dave Slepian is create a model that's complicated enough to describe a new phenomena that you're interested in, but not so complicated that you can't do anything with it. Okay? And that's what I'm going to tell you about now. We're going to have a model for this, and then go back to Shannon and say, ah, you know, what kind of interesting things can we find? Well, the channel capacity and other things. So I want to model this. So note that if a data bit written late is the same as the previous bit, there is no error in the recorded bit. But if it's different than the previous bit, there is an error. OK, so here's the model. At time instance, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, let xi be the data bit you want to write, yi be what you actually record, and zi be something that indicates whether you write late or not. And in particular, zi equals 0 if the data bit is written on the correct island, and zi equals 1 if the data bit is written late. OK? Now, said it in another way, yi equals xi if zi equals 0. yi equals xi minus 1, the previous bit, because of the shingling, if zi equals 1. And we can write it as an equation that yi is xi plus the quantity xi plus mod 2, xi minus 1, zi. So notice, if zi is 0, yi equals xi. If zi equals 1, yi equals xi plus xi, which cancels out the xi and gives you the xi minus 1. So it's just this. So now we have a channel, a very, very simple description. Again, is this completely describe what happens in this thing? No. But if we can't do anything with this, we're not going to be able to do anything with something more complicated. And it's easy to make this more complicated, by the way. So just to show you what happens, if you wanted to write this sequence, and this is the z sequence. So what, z0 means you're not writing late. z equal 1 means you're writing late. This is what you would get. So what happens is here, xi is yi, and, but when you have a 1 here, y is xi minus 1. So you get the repeat of the previous one. But this one here, uh, yi equals xi minus 1, which is this 0. OK. So what I'm really interested in is the capacity for this model, Shannon capacity. I don't have it, to be honest. I mean, I'll tell you the end story, is we only have upper and lower bounds and things. It, even this simple model, we couldn't compute the capacity. But we could compute some things. So first of all, we found a very, very trivial, simple rate one half code where you don't get any errors. Contri consider the trivial binary rate one half code where each data bit, mi, is recorded twice. So what I'm going to do is let x2i minus 1 equal x2i equal mi. All right, so let's look at what the even outputs are like. Well, they're x2i plus here's this equation. OK, well, if z of 2i is 0, y2i equals x2i, which is mi. But if, y2I, if zi equals 1, 
y2i is x2i minus 1, which is also mi. So I get the data out. So what does that tell me? So a decoder can decode this rate one-half code with zero error probability by observing the values of y with even indices. And thus, the zero error capacity, which I didn't, I wasn't after, but the zero error capacity of this code is at least one half. Therefore, a lower bound to the capacity is at least one half. OK, so now uh, when, it com when it comes to computing the capacity, we have to have some models for z. And we looked at two models. One is the simplest model is random z. And by the way, from what we've been able to find out from people in industry who are making measurements, this is not such a bad model. OK, so we assume the zi is Bernoulli with parameter p. That is, p is the probability zi equals 1, and the z's are an iid sequence. The other model that we have, we wanted a model for burst errors. So we chose a Gilbert model, a two-state Gilbert model, and zi equals 0 is this state, zi equals 1 is this state, and now there's two parameters, the probability of going from here to here and the probability of going from here to here. Now I should tell you right off, we can't compute the capacity of each, either of these. We don't know how to do it, but we know some things. So for any model for the z process, the channel capacity is defined in the usual manner. We call the capacity of the Bernoulli state model with parameter p, c sub b, b stands for Bernoulli with parameter p, and we call the capacity of the Gilbert state model with parameter, two, a pair of parameters, c sub g, of the pair of parameters. So what can we prove? Well, one thing, it turned out to be obvious afterwards, is that if we replace p by 1 minus p in the Bernoulli model, we get the same capacity. It's kind of interesting. It says 10% uh, writing late is the same as 90% writing late. The reason is, uh, and the reason is that if you have 90% writing late, you're really 10% writing early. And writing early and writing late are the same thing, so it doesn't matter. And for the Bernoulli, I'm sorry, for the Gilbert model, we're able to prove this. Uh, here's some math associated with proving it. I'm just going to skip it at this point. From, uh, OK, so what can we say? The parameter space then for the Bernoulli model, you only have to worry about p being between 0 and 1 half. And uh, and furthermore, the same symmetry holds not just for the capacity, which is the rate maximizing input distribution, but holds for all input distributions. And the capacity of the Bernoulli model is upper bounded. Ah, not so. This is a new subject. <laughs> OK, so now I'm interested in an upper bound to the capacity. And so what we did is we, a way of getting upper bounds is by giving the decoder more information than it normally has. So what we're going to do is have a genie that tells the decoder uh, what the Z process, the, the Z realization really is. And I claim that when we do this, we end up with an erasure channel. So why is this? Given the realization of the z process, whenever zi minus 1 is a 1 and zi equals 0, the value of xi minus 1 cannot be determined from the y process. And why is that? Well, if, a matter of fact, rather than me telling you, I'm going to give you an example that's going to illustrate it. Let me do that later on. Let's assume this is true. Then the Bernoulli state channel is equivalent to a correlated symmetric erasure channel with average erasure rate given by p times 1 minus p. The reason being zi minus 1 is p, and zi equals 0 
occurs with probability 1 minus p. And the resulting erasure channel is correlated since erasures being dependent upon 1 to 0 transitions. You can't have two erasures next to each other, so there's some correlation in it. However, the capacity of a correlated symmetric erasure channel is the same as that of a memoryless symmetric erasure channel. And this, by the way, is not something that I knew. <laughs> and it's kind of strange. It says that for erasures, if you have a symmetric erasure channel, an ordinary erasure channel, zero either comes out as a zero or as an erasure, a one either comes out as a one or an erasure, and it's symmetric. So the probability of erasure is the same whether you sent a zero or a one. Correlation does not increase the capacity or decrease the capacity. It's the same. OK, so let me see if I can get through this. I couldn't last night at 2 in the morning, so I'll try now. I want to show you, I'm going to play the part of the decoder and show you where erasures come in. But the decoder now knows both the Y process and the Z process. So let's see how this works. Uh, oops. Oh. I. OK, we start out and we say we didn't write late. So the y value must be the true value of x. So that tells me x is 0. I didn't write late, so the x value here must be 1. I didn't write late, so the x value here must be 1. So, so far, I've decoded correctly. OK, now I've written late. So the y value here is not the x value at that time, but the previous x value. So it's a zero. Um, oh, wait a minute. Uh, the y value here, why did I point to here? Uh, hang on. <laughs> um, OK, let me do it again. I have the z is 1, so I know I've written late. And so, ah, so in order to, for me, ah, for, in order for me to find out what the x value is here, I have to go, because of the shingling, to the next y value. And that tells me this. But here I have a 1, and I have no way of knowing what this is, because this thing here, this, because of the shingling, this overwrote what this was supposed to be, and this is an erasure. And if you can follow that, you're better than I am now. <laughs> but it's, it's correct. So we end up with an erasure channel, and we get an upper bound to the capacity. I just want to illustrate some of the techniques we used. Uh, for, the, uh, for the Bernoulli model, the input distribution that maximizes the mutual information, we couldn't find out. And uh, so no closed form expression has been found for the capacity of the Bernoulli model. However, lower bounds on the capacity can be found by assuming a particular input distribution. So what, you know, what if we assume? Well, why not assume an IID input? Uh, we would think that might be good. And there's no reason to make the input asymmetric. So we assume IID input equally likely. And when we do this, we get uh, a, a lower bound. And very tight upper and lower bounds have been found for the symmetric information. Ah, and that's called the symmetric information rate, when you have uh, equally likely IID input. And we could find very tight upper and lower bounds for this. And I'll show you some curves in a little bit. And here they are. Now, the interesting thing here is Remember, the capacity we know is greater than or equal to a half. But the upper and the lower bounds on the symmetric information rate go below a half. Here's a half, and this is a blow up of what's happening here. So what that tells us 
is that the symmetric information rate is not uh, capacity achieving. We wouldn't expect it to be capacity achieving, but we should maybe be looking at some kind of correlated input. So we, so we still have a Bernoulli Z process, which are independent, but we assumed a correlated input. And uh, so note that on the previous slide, for some values of P, an upper bound to the symmetric information rate is strictly less than half. Uh, but this shows, so all that says that. So what we did next is to assume for the Bernoulli input a correlated input. And what kind of correlated input? Well, we assumed a two-state Markov process for it. And indeed, we maximize the, we maximize things with respect to the parameters. And we ended up with this. And where the red now are bounds on for the Markovian source, and the blue were bounds for the independent. Does that answer your question? No. But let me tell you, uh, what we're really interested in is up in this region here, and it looks to us that there's good codes could be found at high rates. Because the capacity, one way or the other, uh, is you know, up around 0.9 or so. And so we should be able to find good codes. Have we found good codes? Not yet. OK. Um, and you know what? I'm going to, well, maybe you'd be interested in this. Um, OK. People have looked at something similar to this. And some of you might be saying, hey, I've seen things like this, but people describe it in terms of insertions and deletions. It turns out that's not a different description. It's exactly the same description. And you can look at this from the standpoint of insertions and deletions. And what happens is simply this, that if the z's are, if the z equal ones are separated by a lot of z's equal zeros, and you have isolated z's uh, equal one, it doesn't make much sense to think of it in terms of insertions and deletions. Just think of it in terms of errors. If, on the other hand, you have a long string of z equals ones, then it turns out the beginning of that string causes you to have a insertion, and the end of the string causes you to have a deletion. So you can describe this in terms of insertions and deletions. And that's what this whole thing is about. And so I'm about ready to switch gears. And I'm going to switch gears by talking in a moment about flash memory. And some of you out in the hall were asking me already about flash memory. But how about hard disk drives? So my comments on that, other than who knows, is people have been predicting the death of magnetic hard disk drives for many years, at least 25, because that's what my friends told me 25 years ago, is a dead subject. Uh, and lacking a prognostoscope, which is a word I got from going to a medical talk. <laughs> OK, it's not a real device. It's difficult to predict how long hard disk drives will remain the storage device of choice. However, magnetic hard disk drive seems to be a cat with nine lives, having beat out all the competitors in the past. So um, that's my story on hard disk drives. So the last part of the talk is another research project we're doing on coding for flash. And some of you know about flash, others don't. So let me give you a update on flash. First of all, it's a non-volatile solid state memory, which is fast, power efficient, and has no moving parts. Those are all really good things. If the answer, if there was another thing there that said really cheap, that would be the best. <laughs> but it's not really cheap, but it's not too far different from hard disk drives. It's electrically programmed and erased. 
and it's used in loads of things. So no information there. So what is it? It's an array of cells made from something called floating gate transistors. What are floating gate transistors? I have no idea. But they're made from floating gate transistors. <laughs> OK. The cells are subdivided into blocks and then into pages. And the cells are programmed by putting electrons into these cells. And so here is a picture of some cells. And first we put electrons kind of one way and then the other. And eventually we're going to put some electrons in there. And needless to say, I didn't make this slide. <laughs> I have a graduate student who knows how to do these things. OK. So lo and behold, we end up by putting some electrons in that one cell. And so now I want to tell you what's going on. So at the end, you might have you know, some electrons in this cell, none in this one, a uh, whole bunch in this one. So each cell can have Q levels represented by different amounts of electrons. So this is good. Uh, however, many of the flash drives you buy now, Q is 2. So on today's products, Q is 2, and that's called single level flash, single level cells. And, but Q equal 4 means you can get 2 bits into a cell. 3 is 8 bits. It's a, uh, I'm sorry. In any event, you know what I mean. Now, this is the kicker. In order to reduce a cell level, I told you how you pour electrons in. In order to reduce a cell level, all the cells in that block must be reset to level zero. It's kind of like this is a huge bathtub and you pull the plug. And all the electrons go out, and then you start again. OK. That's a very expensive operation. And how many bits in a block? Like a million. So it's a lot of bits to erase a cell. So the, give you an idea of size, the memory consists of blocks. The size of each block is 128 or 256 kilobytes. So I didn't say it right. 8 times 256, I don't know, whatever that is. That's the size of a block. And each block consists of pages. And the size of each page is about 2 kilobytes. And that's roughly what you write onto a hard disk drive, what's called a sector. It's about 2 kilobytes. And so writing, what you do is also you have to write sequentially. It's not clear to me why, but you do. So here's a block, and you write this page, and then this page, and you write all those pages, and you write these, and then you write these. And then all of a sudden, you want to write something else in here. OK? Well, you can't just overwrite that cell. You have to pull the plug on all of this and then write it again to write that. OK. Uh, problem is the erase operation wears out a flash drive. It's called the endurance. And the endurance of a flash memory is related to the number of times the blocks are erased. And in single level flash with Q equal 2, a block can tolerate about uh, 10,000 to 100,000 erasures before it starts producing errors. And it's called single level uh, cell SLC. And the larger the value of Q, the less the endurance. And the goal is to represent the data efficiently efficiently such that the block erasures are postponed as much as possible. So fortunate for us at uh, UCSD, we have a group in the computer science department who likes to do stuff. Do that, I mean measure things. So what we did is we erased a block, we wrote pseudo-random data, and then we read it, and then we erased it over and over again. And this is a caveat saying it was done under lab conditions, so you can't take these numbers to mean what would happen if you bought one. 
But to show you what happens is this is for single level flash. This is the number of iterations times a million. So this is 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, etc. And this is bit error rate. And what happens is the bit error rate's very low. And then all of a sudden, about here, it starts taking off. And this is times 10 to the minus 4. So do they use a lot of coding? No. What they do is they say, don't go past this point here. OK? And then you don't need a lot of coding. For multi-level, MLC stands for multi-level. And this was for just Q equal 4. So it's only 2 bits per cell. Notice the number of iterations starts taking off. This is times 10 to the fifth, not times 10 to the sixth. And this error rate is 10 to the minus 3. So it takes off much faster than the other. And, the, and this is the lifetime guaranteed by the manufacturer there. Okay. There's another aspect, and that is there's other ways you can mess up your data. And one of the best ways is to take that laptop, lock it in my car, and put it out in the sun. It's not a good thing to do. It's not a good thing to do for your flash drive. Uh, what happens, it turns out it's good for the cell. It cleans it up, but it cleans it up by destroying what's in there. So the, it's bad for the data, but good for the cell. <laughs> and in other words, if you wanted to, you could cook the flash drive once it starts producing errors and then get that back here. OK, so how can you make this into an interesting information theory problem? Well, we went back in history <laughs> to something which are called WAM codes. And the interesting thing is it came out of work when people were talking about punch cards. And uh, Ravest and Shamir, who some of you know from RSA algorithm, uh, wrote a paper on this. And then I went back in my own history. It turns out Aaron Weiner and I wrote a paper on this also a long, long time ago. And so I want to tell you about this. It's really interesting if you've never seen it. It's a way of writing two bits in three cells twice without erasing. So I write two bits. And I can read those two bits and read them and read them and read them. And then when I don't want those two bits anymore, I can write two, bit, two more bits in that same cell, same three cells, and without erasing. And why is that? Well, because uh, I'm going to skip that. Here's the code. Here's the first time I write. I'm very, very careful I don't write too many once. Because ones are the things you'd have to erase. So the first time I write, I either use this pattern, this pattern, this pattern, or this pattern. The second time I write, if I want to write 0, 0, I write 1, 1, 1. Now, if you're really alert and looking at this, you can see that you can go from this to any one of these four. You can go from this to this, you can go from here to here, but you can't, and from here to here, but you can't go from here to here. Because here was a one, and you want there to be a zero. But that's not a problem. Because if you've written zero one in there, oh, and you also read before write now. If you've written zero one in there, and you want write zero one again, just leave it alone. Okay? So when you go to read, 0, 1 is either this or that. OK? Well, what are we gaining from this? In a sense, we're writing four bits. You can't read them all at once. You're writing two and then two in th only three cells without erasing. OK? So when we showed this to the people who make flash drives, they got very interested. And this in yes, good. This one, you can go to any of them. Does that mean, does that mean that there's extra room for yes, there's extra room. There's extra room. Yeah. Uh, yes. But I don't think you can exploit it at this level. As a matter of fact, so the real question is, 
how can we get good codes when we're talking about writing more than two bits and we're talking about more than three cells? And so that was the task we set ourselves after trying to find good WAM codes and doing it for two writes and then more than two writes. I should tell you that people who don't know information theory want, want the world. Like they said, okay, I mean, we showed this to one of the flash companies and they said, fantastic, uh, that's the best thing ever. We want to double our capacity this way with two writes. Well, this is where information theory plays a part again. So let me jump to that. And that is, well, first of all, let me tell you that if I let VI be the number of messages on the ith write. I define RI as log base 2 of VI divided by N. And then the sum rate is the sum of the rates. Okay. What they wanted is two writes and a sum rate of 2. They want two bits per cell. And this is now binary cells. These are not multi-level cells. And they would like it with two writes. So they would like, and it, well, first of all, we, you can almost guess you can't do that. That means you get one bit per cell the first time. How are you ever going to do this? But that's what they wanted. So the reverse Shamir code has rate R1 equals R2 is 2 thirds, and the sum rate is 4 thirds. They wanted two. OK, well, it turns out Shannon comes to the rescue again. You can look at this as it's kind of interesting. It's almost coding for the uh, dirty paper coding. But it's dirty paper coding. It's sort of soiled paper coding rather than dirty paper coding. Because the first person who writes that's putting the first write on is cooperating with you. So it's not using too much dirt. And then you come along and you do the next one. But you can figure out that there's a rate region associated with this. This is not original to us, by the way. This is other people have done this. And so, and the capacity region is you have a parameter p, which is essentially the probability of writing a 1. OK. And r1 is less than or equal to the binary entropy function, and r2 is uh, less than or equal to actually the capacity region as if the p's were erasures. And uh, you can optimize the sum rate. And it turns out it's really neat. The sum rate optimizes when p equals a third, which is kind of what the reverse Shamir code is doing. I mean, he's using either no, no ones or one one. And the maximum sum rate is 1.58. So there's no way you can get two. On the other hand, try to talk to people who don't know information theory and tell them this is what Shannon said. They say, yeah, but you guys can do it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to, uh, so now I should look at time. 12 and a half minutes. OK, I think I can show you the construction we use. First of all, what to me was exciting about this so I have a graduate student. I'll show you his picture at the end. Uh, um, and he's great at getting other people to do work. Matter of fact, he's going to be a great professor. He's, <laughs> he's, uh, and so I teamed him up with a really bright undergraduate. And they end up writing papers on this stuff and finding better codes than anybody else has ever found. So let me tell you the construction we use. It's based upon a linear block code. So we take a linear NK block code. This is an ordinary you know, algebraic coding uh, that has a parity check matrix H. And R, which is N minus K, we make it so that's the rank of H, so that the equations are linearly independent. OK, and the first time we write V, we're going to choose the vectors in a particular way. The way we're going to choose it is we're going to modify this matrix H as a function of V by taking the, we're going to look at V, look where the ones were in V, 
and replace the columns of H corresponding to those positions by zeros. And I'll show you an example where we do this. And then we're only going to write V's if the remaining columns have rank R. So we haven't destroyed the rank of H. And on the first right, we'll only write those vectors V such as the rank of H of V. This is the modified matrix H where we've replaced some columns by zeros equals R. And if we can write V1 uh, vectors the first time, the rank, uh, sorry, the rate for the first right is log base 2 of the number of columns V1, the number of vectors V1 divided by n. And what we'll show is that at the second right, we can write R bits. And that's really the scheme. So on the second right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to consider a data vector S2 of R bits. This is what we want to write on the second right. And we're going to take, we're going to find an E2 such that H times E1, where E1 is what I wrote the first time, uh, is, <laughs> ah, I have a feeling I left out, no, here it is, okay, here it is. I, I take what I wrote the first time, which here I call E1, and I compute the syndrome of it in the ordinary way, and I call that S1. And then I take S1 plus S2, and I take this modified of matrix H, multiply it by E2, and say, this is what I want to write the second time. I'm sure you can't follow that. But on the other hand, it turns out it works because a solution to E2 always exists because the rank of H of E1 is equal to R. And I, maybe the example I'll give will show this. In any event, that's the procedure. And that's what you write to memory. And decoding is really simple. What you do is you take E1 plus E2, which is what you've now written in the memory, multiply it by H, and you end up with S2. So decoding is very, very simple. And so the rate on the second right is R over N, or N minus K divided by N, and the sum rate is given by this. So I'll tell you what, before I give you this example, let me just show you why we do it, and then if I have time, I'll go back to the example. OK. So let me tell you what the results are of doing this. We did a computer search. And the best value of R, the sum rate, previously achieved by two rights was in a paper by Wu, and it was 1.371. We obtained many codes that bettered their result, this result. And we based it upon standard codes, like the Golay 2412 code, where we found the sum rate of 1.45. By the way, remember what the capacity is, 1.58. So this is getting close. And the 2311, we were able to get 1.46. And we used the dual of a particular reed muller code, and we got 1.4566. Uh, my guess is we're getting close to. Now, this is a construction. Who knows what the best, well, matter of fact, from Shannon, we know what the best could possibly be, but we don't know a, a deterministic construction that gives that. And so just to give you an idea, uh, let me just show you some results we have. OK, so let me see if I can find it. Uh, but I have to come over here now to read. OK, so first of all, this is the capacity region that's obtained by the information theoretic result. This is the line where R1 equals R2. And Reves Shamir is on that line somewhere. Ah, right here. So this is Reves Shamir, R1 is 2 thirds, and R2 is 2 thirds. Okay, using our 
constructions, we get all of these points along here, and then by time sharing, we can get points in between. Uh, we can also, it's a little harder, get points on the line just by wasting things. Like if V1 is not a power of 2, we bring it down to, uh, actually, we bring it down to R2, and we make R1 equal R2, and we got some points on here. So this is basically the kind of results we get. Um, Absolutely correct. There's an appro a particular approach taken that you're doing a block construction. I, I'll tell you something this reminds me of. Uh, okay. The capacity region of a particular multiple access channel with feedback has exactly that blue shape form. And there are some interesting feedback strategies based on like Horsheim's methods and so on. And that's why I, I thought maybe there might be a variable length approach based on feedback methods. And I think you do have feedback here in the sense that you can measure. You what can that's read. Written. That's correct. And so maybe there's a direct connection. If there was one, that would be really neat. It's the same uh, structure. Okay. So, well, let me try because I have the mic. Okay. Um, what Gerhard said is this reminds him of a particular. Of, well, feedback channel, multiple access feedback channel result. And in particular, he said the blue curve is the capacity region for this, for that, and that may be variable length codes or variable length and maybe variable rate, who knows. Uh, I think it's terrific. I mean, I would, I think it's worthwhile looking at. I think this whole subject, as far as I know, People haven't looked at WAM codes in years. And so this is a new reason to look at WAM codes. Which gets me, OK, well, first of all, I don't want to, that's a great, great comment. And uh, uh, any other questions while we're doing this? Uh, I think I'm going to skip the example, because it's tedious, and I think it'll just kind of make you more convinced that it's complicated. <laughs> and it's not. It's not. It's just, it's hard to explain. Um, let me finish up on the slides and then just kind of review. Well, first of all, we did multiple write codes. So this is uh, codes for three writes, four writes, five writes. This is what the uh, upper bound, the upper bound being the Shannon sum rate. And notice that from uh, from three on, the upper bound is two and above. So, but <laughs> the upper bound here being two, that would be hard to achieve. But maybe with four rights we could achieve this. This is the best we were able to achieve. We almost have two with four rights. And, uh, and our four right construction is based upon finding good two right codes and then putting them in a pot and stirring them around, etc. cetera. Um, anyway, this was the second project I wanted to tell you about. So uh, if you haven't already guessed the answer to the question, can an information theorist be happy in a center for information storage, is a resounding yes. But I have a caveat to that. I would say if you end up in a situation like that, Make it what you want it to be, not what other people tell you it is. Because if, we follow, if I followed the leads of what the physicists were telling me, I wouldn't be doing this stuff. And, uh, and probably they're right. I shouldn't be, but that's besides the point. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so who are collaborators on this talk? Uh, who's that? Paul Siegel. OK. Uh, this is Arvind, who he did the first, uh, the shingled writing on pattern media information theory stuff. Uh, and interestingly, he's now working this summer with Rudiger uh, on a different project. And this is Eitan Jacobi, uh, who is working with this undergraduate, Scott Kaiser. 
and he's doing the WAM code stuff. And this is uh, the CMRR students, faculty, etc. when we did a 25th reunion cruise. And finally, I would like to thank all my PhD students, and there's a missing link there, <laughs> Roberto Padovani. And so if I had to say one last piece of advice for any of you going into teaching, it's an obvious one, everybody would tell you, find really good students, and then you don't have to do anything, you just sit back. <laughs> and so, thank you. Uh, are there any final remarks or questions from anyone? Uh, yes, Sergio. Uh, uh, I wonder if you could say something about combined um, error correction coordinates and same frequency, and in particular the fundamental meanings about that. Okay. Um, okay, so the question was combining error correction codes and uh, modulation codes, or constrained sequences. And what I could say about it, and uh, finding good codes, and maybe theoretical. Well, first of all, that was one of the problems. I mean, again, we took the simplest possible uh, model we could think of. We said, OK, suppose I take a binary symmetric channel as my noisy channel. And, but I'll only use sequences that satisfy a particular constraint. Find the capacity. Well, you can write down the formulas. You know, it's, it's maximize the mutual information with respect to input sequences that satisfy the constraint. We were never able to get any closed form solution. We'd never found a constraint that we could even find an example where we could find a nice closed form solution. But that's. That's sort of treating it as an information theorist. From a practical standpoint, it turns out it to be an extremely important question because I, I gave you a block diagram where you do the error correction encoding and then the modulation encoding. Well, clearly you want to do that because the modulation encoder is what you want to write, the output of the modulation encoder. But look at it from the other end. It says you have to demodulate the modulation decoder before you do the error correction. And that could be a disaster. And so people have combined the two in sort of a just stupid way in some sense. And what they do is they use a systematic code. They do the modulation encoding first. And therefore, all the information bits satisfy the constraint. The only ones that don't satisfy the constraint are the parity bits that you've computed. And then you put them through a modulation encoder. Now, why does that work is because they like very high rate codes. So there are very few parity bits to start out with. And so the inefficiency of it isn't so bad. But is it optimal? Absolutely not. But it's a Good practical problem. That's about all I know about it. Yes. Well, that okay. So the question was, how much can you increase the capacity using the islands? This depends. Uh, I don't know the answer, but it depends upon how you, uh, the lithography of making the pattern media. And uh, I mean, they're talking uh, about islands that are maybe 25 nanometers in diameter and, and the, uh, the center to center uh, Spacing between the islands is 20, is uh, 12 and a half, 12 and a half plus another 25, so 50, um, and that gives them another factor of two from where they are, 
and but there's no reason why it can't be smaller than that if they can get the lithography down. Uh, the real issue is can you really make a patterning that is regular enough to uh, to make this whole thing uh, work? Also, I showed it as if it were a rectangular grid. You probably want to do something like hexagonal packing because you can get things closer together that way. Fortunately, at CMRR, we have people who are doing the lithography. So that part of it is being uh, worked on. Okay, do you, <laughs> uh, so the question is uh, constraints on the decoder costs. Uh, the answer is always, and anything you come up with, the first reaction is it's too expensive. And on the other hand, as we know, things that are too expensive this year are not too expensive next year. I don't have a good answer to that, but certainly cost is an enormous driver in this whole thing. Uh, I mean, if you're going to sell something for $100, it's a commodity item at that point. And so an extra dollar is, is a big thing for them to worry about. Power or energy. So that's where flash people are really excited about it because of the fact that it absorbs no power. You don't have anything spinning. Um, and uh, there's, I don't have anything I can tell you offhand about it, but yes, they worry about it. Uh, I could tell you one other thing while I think of it. It's, it's somewhat related. And you know what you worry about is things like, what happens if you're programming Flash and the power goes out. Uh, what happens? Can, how can you recover from that? That's a, a big issue. Oh, well, I think he wants yeah, to get, we go for lunch. Yeah. I'll be around, so I'm happy to talk to everybody. So let's thank Jack yeah. again. We'll head to lunch. Lunch is uh, in front of the electrical engineering building that way. <laughs>